All right, everyone, welcome to Politics and Prose Live. Uh, we're here tonight with Jacob S. Hacker and Paul Pearson and Veshla Weaver. And uh, we're going to get started in just a moment. I'm going to do some quick housekeeping. First off, I want to draw everyone's attention to the bottom of your Zoom window. There's a Q&A button at the bottom there. And we encourage all of you to ask a question of the authors. We're going to try to get to those in the latter portion of the event. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. So if you click on that, you can type your question in there and we will try to get to them. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is in the chat window, I've just sent out a link to tonight's book, Let Them Eat Tweets. And we really encourage everyone to purchase a copy. It's a great way to support our authors and also support politics and prose. Now with that out of the way, it is my honor to introduce Jacob S. Hacker and Paul Pearson. Jacob S. Hacker is a political scientist at Yale University, and Paul Pearson is a political scientist at the University of California, Berkeley. They are the co-authors of three books, including the New York Times bestseller, Winner Take All Politics. Tonight, they'll be discussing their latest book, Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality, which is a groundbreaking account of the dangerous marriage of plutocratic economic priorities and right-wing populist appeals, and how it threatens the pillars of American democracy. Drawing on decades of research, they authoritatively explain the doom loop of tax cutting and fear mongering that characterizes our era and reveals how we can fight back. Tonight, we are also joined by Veshla Weaver, who is the Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor of Political Science and Sociology at John Hopkins University and a 2016-17 Andrew Carnegie Fellow. She has contributed to scholarly debates around the persistence of racial inequality, colorism in the United States, the causes and consequences of the dramatic rise in prisons and the consequences of rising economic polarization. Uh, so we're in for a really awesome conversation tonight. Everyone help me join Jacob, Paul, and Veshla. Thank you. Well, so I'm very honored to be able to discuss this book, um, which is really delivering on some of uh, uh, Jacob and Paul's um, past really big concepts and doing it um, for our moment, doing it in such an impressive, expansive way. And I'm deeply honored also because um, so much of their work um, has shaped my own thinking over the years and has really created a space to think about um, extreme inequality. And though I don't study uh, income inequality per se, um, they've given us a language um, and, and a, a method of studying developments in the American polity. So it's, it's just great to be here with you both, um, dear colleagues of mine. Um, so let me just jump right in um, with a first question. Um, so your book, many of the audience probably haven't read it yet, it's hot, hot off the press, um, but your book traces the rise of an extreme shift rightward on economic issues, what you call a plutocratic agenda um, of the GOP, which leads to this hardening of extreme inequality and extreme measures and efforts and rigging to end up sustaining it. And what really struck me is how much this shift um, stood out in comparison to our democratic peers abroad and also to our own uh, history. Um, and readers will appreciate how your book goes to great lengths to show just how distinctive this moment is from the past. The chapter uh, discussing Richard Nixon's economic liberalism even housed within his very deeply racialized Southern strategy was just really evocative and revealing and brought this into sharp focus, as well as how these developments weren't at all inevitable. In fact, you say that, uh, you know, right smack in the middle of the book, this was not inevitable. Um, so can you tell us why and how this happened and what are the most important features of this plutocratic populism? Um, there seems that there was a moment where this emerging plutocratic wing of the GOP didn't have the hold that it now does. Um, so why did the plutocrats win? Yeah, well, thank you, Vesela, and thanks for the kind introduction. And, um, and you very well summarized the sort of core argument that we want to make, which is that America is really unusual, uh, in mm -hmm. fact, among rich democracies 
unique in the degree to which we've seen this massive rise of inequality. And it, it's inequality that's taken this very special form, not special in a good way, where most of the gains of growth have gone to the very, very top of the income ladder. And, and very uh, and wealth has become very, very concentrated. And that's a story that we've told before, but I think in a way that we, we hadn't realized before, the two major features of our politics today um, have roots in this fundamental transformation. So, so in a lot of ways, right, Nixon is a great counterpoint to Trump um, because in his sort of appeal to working white working class voters, Nixon, you know, was very much trying to exploit the, the backlash against the civil rights movement. He um, thought that the Republican Party could finally compete in the South because of this huge pool of white voters who were essentially um, uh, opposed to the continuing gains for African-Americans that were a product of the civil rights revolution. But, but just importantly, Nixon was totally different from Trump in that he pursued what would today be considered social democratic policies, right? I mean, he wanted to ma he massively expanded social security, wanted to create a basic guaranteed income. Uh, he created the Environmental Protection Agency. So the question really is, what what happens to a political system when you when you take a kind of mainstream conservative party that is allied with business and trying to appeal to voters and hit it with this massive transformation, this huge rise of inequality? And what happens is we argue is that you get a party that's simultaneously right-wing populist, that is, is evoking these same kind of themes of racial resentment, in fact, ginning them up even more, but it's also, as you say, highly plutocratic. It's government of, by, and for the rich. So as Paul can elaborate, it's that second side, the, the, the way in which right-wing populism gets married with plutocratic policy that we found to be the most sort of revelatory aspect of our investigation, because we, we just hadn't seen as clearly before how much both these developments were rooted in this structural transformation. So I guess just to, to jump on that, that piece of the story, um, we, fo you know, we focus in the book on the Republican Party because what we've learned in, in thinking about the relationship between uh, the, the the growth of, of outrage politics and ethno-nationalist -national pol nationalist politics combined with inequality is that it's actually a very old story in democracies that has historically run through conservative parties because those are the parties that face what we call the conservative dilemma, uh, which is they're, they're trying to, and th this goes back to the dawn of democracy, they're trying to compete uh, in elections where they have to be able to get the majority uh, majority of the vote, but they're they're aligned with an economic elite that makes it very hard for them to compete that way. So they basically face a choice. They can either moderate on economics, uh, expand their economic appeal, uh, and reach to people further down the income scale, uh, or they have to find a way to make politics about something else. Uh, and Veshal, you were you were talking at the beginning about these the sort of the roads not taken that we that we talk about in the book. There are a number of points in the recent history of the Republican Party, maybe the most dramatic, we could, could talk about it later, would be the 2000 uh, campaign between John McCain and George W. Bush, with W being the candidate of the plutocrats and McCain being um, a, a much more of a reformist figure who basically wanted to resolve this conservative dilemma in a different way and had much more moderate economic appeals, wanted to reform the campaign finance system. So this is a conversation, an argument that went on in the Republican Party over decades. Uh, but increasingly, uh, as inequality grew in the US, uh, and as the party, especially beginning with Newt Gingrich and then reinforced uh, by George W. Bush, the party really decided to embrace the winners in our winner-take-all economy. It forced them to take this much more combative, outrage generating a political path. So uh, I wanna come back to the conservative dilemma in, a little bit later because I had a, a somewhat of an epiphany after reading and just, I kept circling this idea, um, but hold that for now. Um, another key idea in, in your, that your book drives home is that 
voters do not support this agenda of deep tax cuts for the rich time and time again, disinvestment in the things they do want, other policies uh, meant to boost prosperity among this really thin sliver uh, of the electorate, the super rich. Um, and you, you tell us that the, DO, the GOP time and time again was able to halt policies most Americans wanted. And so the natural question becomes, how does a party, you know, not become obsolete that delivers 80% of its gains of the last tax cut to the top 1%, right? Um, those policy harms are visited on some parts of their base. And so how do they keep you know, baldly delivering economic victories to the most powerful and, and the most economic elite and maintain themselves in office. And this is something that others, you know, it's the kind of what's the problem with Kansas um, kind of question. Um, and what you're suggesting is that it's a fundamental problem that all conservative parties have and do face in democracies that display both concentrated wealth and income inequality and simultaneously dispersed political power because they're democracies, everyone can vote. We can vote them out of office if we want. And this is where you bring in the three R's, resentment, racialization, and rigging. Um, and so talk about that a little bit um, and talk about the sort of coupling of this extreme economic agenda with racial appeals. Well, I'll just say a little bit and then let Paul elaborate because uh, maybe I'll take up one or two of the R's. Um, so let me, the, the easiest one to talk about, and we can always come back to it, is that it's really worth noting that Republicans have found it harder and harder to win, uh, especially as they've come to rely more and more on these kinds of appeals that only really work with, you know, uh, white Christian uh, rural voters. And we, we'll come back to that, but they found it harder and harder. And so the rigging, the vote rigging, like extreme partisan gerrymandering or voter suppression efforts is a really important part of the story about how they maintain power. It's not just that they figure out ways to appeal to these voters and keep them coming to the polls and get them more and more outraged. It's also that they figure out ways to make the votes of those voters count a lot more. But let me just mention resentment because, um, you know, the the story that Paul alluded to is the story is a longstanding story about conservative parties. You could write a book that's what's the matter with Britain or what's the matter with Germany? Because in fact, as we tell in the book, both conservative parties in both those countries in the early 20th century, as the as the franchise was expanding, were like, figuring out how, how do we get working class voters to support us when we want to defend the rich, right? So it's the same basic problem. And, um, and the, the kind of key figure in our story, even though we don't think this is just a engineered, you know, uh, 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 elite, you know, entirely elite driven process, we do think there are these key figures. And one of them is this, is this political operative we all know the name of, Lee Atwater who in 1983, before he designs this, the famous Willie or infamous Willie Horton ad, uh, and, and before he uh, becomes you know, known for some of his inflammatory um, and, and really outrageous um, campaign strategies, he writes this memo uh, to the Reagan campaign in 1983. And he basically says, our problem is we need to pick up a lot of voters who really like government policies that help them um, but but um, but who are also really conservative on cultural and racial issues. And he called these voters, and I'm not making this up, he called them populists. He said, we need to get the populists. So this is back in 83. And so basically you see Atwater's strategy as the party becomes more and more tied to these policies that the populists aren't gonna like, uh, they become more and more reliant on the other side, on the racial and cultural backlash to get those voters. So um, just, you know, I think an important thing to emphasize about why the US really does stand out from other countries in what, in what has been happening. You, yeah, you can see some echoes of this in other countries and you can see, see it in the experience of other conservative parties. Um, but inequality in the US has become uniquely extreme 
among wealthy countries. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that because mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we all recognize that inequality has grown in, in uh, the global economy, uh, but it has really grown much more dramatically in the US with the gains much more concentrated at the top. And, and that both intensifies um, the conflict that these parties face, right? Because the gap between what's in the economic interests of those at the very top and the economic interests of everybody else is growing, right? But it also makes them more inclined, and we see this happen with the Republican Party, more inclined to throw in their lot with the, with the wealthy and with powerful corporations because, because those groups have so many resources in the society, right? So, so in the United States, the Republican Party makes its choice, haltingly at first, but increasingly with the arrival of Newt Gingrich and then in the decades after that with, with great enthusiasm so that the only thing you can count on with any Republican uh, in power is that they're gonna try to cut taxes for the wealthiest Americans, right? The, and, and those cuts become so out of step with what most Americans want, including what Republican voters want, that they have to work harder and harder to try to find other ways of appealing uh, to ordinary voters. And so a, a critical part of the story that I think maybe, you know, maybe we should introduce at this point is uh, that the, the party finds itself driven to find allies that can help generate attention um, and outrage for these other things that it wants to talk about in politics, uh, for these kind of cultural uh, appeals that it wants to make that are increasingly wrapped up with white identity, which is why we think that the generation what we call the outrage machine is such an important part, part of the story of what's happened to the Republican Party. Mm. Just on the, the you know, initial point you were making, Paul, you know, you, don't, you all don't say this exactly, but I interpreted you as saying this. Um, normally, as scholars, we think that democracies constrain inequality, right? That in a system where people can vote and make their will known, that huge inequalities that you show in the book are not sustainable, right? We, you know, parties get elected out. Um, and what you, what you all were suggesting in the book is that actually it's also the inverse, that extreme inequalities, once we've arrived there, can actually lead to a slippage in, um, through this rigging in democratic uh, 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 institutions, right? We can begin to slip towards rule breaking. Um, which you gave very many uh, haunting e examples um, of. What else has transformed as a result? Um, you know, do we see different ways of governing? Do we see, um, you know, you, you suggest, of course, that this isn't just a matter of wealth hoarding and, and padding a, a very uh, wealthy elite and unresponsiveness to average voters, but actually that democracy itself is very much hangs in the balance there. Um, and that the dynamics once set in motion are very difficult actually to undermine. Um, and so I just say two things. Um, one is that even though I've read your work many times over uh, many, you know, use it in my classes, use your concepts, winner take all, uh, in my classes, it hits me every time how just how much inequality has spiked. Um, so can you talk, and, and one figure in particular, figures one and two, for those who don't have the book, just really struck me as like, we have mischaracterized inequality in this country. We, see, we think that we are sort of somewhat close to the UK uh, and somewhat close to Canada. But what you see in, in figures uh, one and two on, on 46 and 47 just hit me, uh, um, and I'll probably use it if it's okay in my classes, is the top 1% in the US goes way up and the top, uh, the bottom 50% goes, goes way down in terms of um, the share of, of, of income, right? Um, and then you look at Western Europe and instead of this, you know, crisscross pattern, you get a, um, let me see if we can show this actually. This is my version of PowerPoint. Um, you, you know, go. you get a totally flat uh, dynamic. The, the, the bottom 50% in Western Europe versus the top 
it's a totally, you know, it's not even a mirror image. It's just a totally different landscape. So maybe give, give uh, uh, future readers some sense of how you think we have gotten this story wrong, right? How have we mischaracterized what this looks like and what ought we, you know, for a reader who first flips this open, they might be caught off guard by the term plutocracy, right? Um, but then they get to that image. And uh, so tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so first of all, that, that figure is the work of the Thomas Piketty and his colleagues in the World Inequality um, uh, Global Inequality Database, and it's just amazing data. Um, and I think the, the really important point to make here is that you know, since the election, we've focused in so much on the idea that the United States looks just like these other rich democracies that are seeing right-wing populism, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's no question that Donald Trump and the strains of the party that were leading to him are deeply uh, evoking that kind of those right wing ethno nationalist appeals, uh, but but it's being layered. It's on a in a very different kind of context, one with these massive levels of inequality. And so, when you go back to the founding of democracy, what you find is that when you have this kind of extreme inequality, there's a kind of triple threat to democracy, right? The this because the, the, the democracy is really, the fundamental idea of democracy is everyone should have a kind of equal potential to influence what government does. And when you get that kind of extreme inequality, then those at the top have not just much more resources, right? They also have much more power. So that's one threat. Um, they also have, uh, they come to have very distinct interests, right? When they're close to the middle class, in their incomes and wealth and well and, and resource and power, then their interests are often much more aligned. And then, and that's what makes us optimistic about democracies in the modern era, right? That they created broad middle class, they created uh, more equal societies. And then the third threat, uh, and the one that I think is really, really scares us, is that the elite become less invested in democracy itself. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is that the the the, the, the plutocrats aren't, aren't like, they're not like Bond villains in their hidden lair inside a volcano, right? They don't say, you know, bring out the three R's. And by the way, the third R is racialization, which we can talk about, but it's basically the idea that you turn everything, you know, if you're talking about government, it's really about giving away stuff to dark skinned people, right? So it's make everything about race, but in a sort of subtext. So they don't just say, bring out the three R's, right? But they demand, from the, the party allied with them, more and more extreme policies that are less and less popular, invoking, uh, unleashing this dynamic. And it is really, I think, important to understand that the plutocrats are not as concerned about democracies unraveling as, as, as we are, as citizens yeah. are and should be. And, and that's, I think, the scary part, because if, if a group has this much power and doesn't feel a responsibility to preserve basic democratic institutions, that's, that's just really dangerous. And we've seen that again and again in history. So another thing that struck me um, that floats to the surface in your, in your book time and again is how once this process is in motion, the process that you just described, Jacob, um, how little even very conservative actors had control over the ensuing dynamics and how once they open, you call it a Pandora's box, um, they had to make subsequent investments in that strategy. And sort of, there, it's almost like this um, bidding war um, um, to become, you know, shrinking electorate that's, you know, demographically. And so you've got to create ever more, you know, and so one, quote I just wanted to bring to the table is, is this, by intensifying the politics of identity to protect the priorities of the plutocracy, Republicans won over voters who might otherwise have rejected a party with a hard right economic agenda. But having invested in division, GOP elites found that they had to keep on investing, not only to attract more voters, but also to respond to those voters' radicalizing views not only to identify new scapegoats, but also to keep those they were scapegoating from ex exercising their growing electoral power. Republican leaders eventually discovered that the extremism that they had unleashed to tackle the conservative dilemma 
was not theirs alone to control. And there are other moments too um, where you suggest even though this is a broad Republican party dynamic that the Republican party itself uh, becomes almost like a, um, a, a, a more of a bit player almost compared to the elites that are really running the show. And I think that's what's really new um, and interesting. And it, it certainly shocked me, you know, you have another moment in the book where you say, you know, this idea that conservative media is just sort of an outgrowth of the GOP is wrong. It's that the conser conservative media, Breitbart, Fox, you know, changed, literally changed the GOP itself. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, th that almost there's this um, one upping that once we embark on a strategy like this, um, and so is that, how do we get out of that? Well, so just let me say just a little bit about it first before we talk about how we how we get out of it. Um, uh, we do think that's a really important dynamic um, and, a, and a frightening dynamic, and you see it um, uh, intensifying. Really, I would say over the last ten or fifteen years, John Boehner's we quote John Boehner's chief of staff saying, "We you know we." We fed the beast who ate right. us, right? Um, and uh, or David Fromm, this famous line from David Fromm, who was a, a George W. Bush speechwriter, who said, "We used to think that Fox mm -hmm. News worked for us, and then we found out that we worked for Fox." Right. right. <laughs> um, and there just there are many you know examples that are really striking when you think about it. That that um, uh, the number two uh, guy in the, uh, the Republican House, Eric Cantor, lost in a primary. Yeah. Uh, basically taken down by a right-wing media attack. Uh, two sitting speakers, John Boehner and Paul Ryan, who basically walked away from the job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, in, in in theory, the second most powerful position in American government. They walked away from it uh, because they were constantly facing these attacks from uh, the right-wing machinery, even though they were extremely conservative, extremely conservative mm -hmm. uh, politicians. Right. So this has been. A dynamic, and and we we talk about the construction of this apparatus um, uh, that generates intensity, that generates a kind of identity politics. Not all of it explicitly racialized. Actually, most of it not explicitly racialized, but having uh, powerful racial undertones to it. So the National Rifle Association, uh, uh, even the evangelical movement, uh, and right wing media are all really important parts of this machinery. Uh, the and it and it does um, it creates a kind of a kind of apparatus that then somebody like Donald Trump can can really exploit right and and uh, use it as a way to um, to cow other parts of the party. The the one thing I think we have to be careful about though before we talk about um, the establishment part of the party as being sort of bit players uh, is that another thing that's made this work is that the establishment, like some people talk about the establishment as having lost the civil war to the more populist forces mm -hmm. to their right. But the reality is that people like Mitch McConnell or the Koch brothers, to take a, a different example, they were thrilled um, by mm -hmm. developments in American politics in mm -hmm. the last few years. They were able to get the judges they wanted on the Supreme Court. They were able to get massive tax cuts. They were able to get their people running key uh, agencies, essentially turning uh, turning the hen houses over to the foxes. Um, yeah. So it is true that they can't completely control what happens uh, with this machinery once once they've created this kind of intensity. Uh, but they've been willing to go along, uh, and they've actually fed a lot of it and continue to feed a lot of it because they've been able to achieve victories that they wouldn't have been able to achieve without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, before we open up for Q and A, I want to ask two final questions, and then I want to end with a little critique. A anybody that that uh, you know knows me knows that the, the <laughs> books I like the most, I'm the most unsettled by, and there's something that's unsettling to me that I want to get figured out. Um, and so I want to raise it. 
But first, um, to me, the book is also um, really just a testament to doing this kind of work, asking the most important questions, distilling a broad array of trends and dynamics and arrangements that may seem, you know, uh, uh, explained by standard explanations, um, but aren't. And, and you all at several points will say, you know, most people see it this way. There's the, been this line after the recent election that this was how, but let me just show you, um, you know, digging into very difficult uh, puzzles and paradoxes and doing it in a way that felt historically very rich, comparative ri comparatively rich, and yet you do it in a way that makes it look easy. So I wondered, you know, sometimes it's nice for listeners to understand your own journey to this book. Um, what were some of the things that kept you up at night? What were some of the things that didn't quite sit well with you? Um, how did you get here? How did you, how did you come to have this idea to write this book? Let me oh, you uh, want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll start at least. So, so uh, in some ways, the book started um, uh, when I was sharing an office with Daniel Ziblatt, um, one of the authors of, of How Democracies Die. And, mm -hmm. and in some ways, we've tried to structure this book somewhat like Levitsky and Ziblatt's How Democracies mm -hmm. Die. We've tried mm -hmm. to explore a, a pretty broad historical range of experiences that we think really help to illuminate uh, the contemporary moment, um, but, do, but do so in a way that we hope is going to be engaging to readers and is not going to require them um, to wade through uh, too, too much academic prose. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it really came out of um, a, you know, conversations with Daniel where he was talking, he was interested in the breakdown of, of democracy in the early 20th century, in Germany in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was studying uh, democracy in the early 21st century, but we were struck uh, increasingly in our conversations by the parallels uh, that we that we saw. Um, not to not to overdraw those parallels because I think that's a danger, but but just recognizing that the the health of a conservative party um, is actually just a fundamental issue in the health of a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to have a healthy democracy without without a healthy conservative party. Uh, and of course, that's something Jacob and I have been interested in a long, for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And we, in many ways, have spent the last 15 or 20 years thinking, trying to, trying to address the question of what has happened to the Republican Party? Um, and because we see that as so fundamental to what's, mm -hmm. what's gone wrong in, in American democracy and American society more broadly. And, and I would say the, the thing that got us going on this book and kept us going on this book, uh, and it was, it was humbling in a lot of ways, um, was waking up to discover that Donald Trump had been elected president of the United States um, uh, with, uh, with a, a political presentation that expressed a kind of overt racism um, that I think we thought was part of America's past, but not mm -hmm. part of America's present. Not that racism was part of America's past, but that that kind of overt racism could be, um, could be embraced by, a, by the winning candidate in a presidential election, even if he didn't get a majority of the vote. Um, and it made us realize that as much time as we had spent studying the Republican Party um, and the growing extremism of the Republican Party, we had failed to really grapple with uh, the centrality of the, the country's racial history um, and the con contemporary pl place of race in American society. Uh, and I, you know, I think that for us was the central project of this book was to see if we could wrestle with that more effectively, um, but also drawing on what we had already discovered about, uh, about the role of economic inequality to come to a better understanding of how we had gotten to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. So um... I, I want to ask you at the end of our conversation, so don't let me forget where we go from here and what you think are the soft spots that we can press on to, to change all of the dynamics we've been talking about. But first, um, I kept coming back to one thing as I read the book, and I'm just very, very eager to hear your answer to this. 
Um, you all are scholars of American political institutions, of historical development. You've done some of the best work we have on the welfare state and on, on American exceptionalism. And when I teach your work, I use it to make the point that governments structure the economy. Uh, inequality is not apolitical. It is driven by actual concrete choices. Um, uh, uh, the inequality of income has everything to do with explicit policy choices. And it really helps students understand that and they can see that. And I'm thinking particularly of winner take all. Um, but yours is a narrative that is focused on prejudice as psychological, as a cultural phenomenon, um, as an identity that can be uh, you know, foisted when, when elites deem it profitable to themselves um, and not as a structure, as a set of institutional arrangements delivering handsome profits of its own and cementing racial power. Um, it is, uh, it may, could be conceived of as delivering policy to benefits to economically marginal uh, whites. Um, and you even say in the book, you know, we, we've had this kind of um, epiphany with, with, you know, in relation to race, we wanted to bring it more centrally into this book, which I very much appreciated. I think you did time and time again. Um, but then race becomes a calculus. It's a, it's a Pandora's box. It's an identity it, rather than itself deeply implicated in capitalism, in wealth hoarding. Um, and so I want to quote from the group uh, Liberation for a Generation in their recent writing on racial capitalism. And they say, yes, White supremacy is alive and well, and it will not end unless basic truths about our economy are recognized. That racism is profitable. It's not about economic you know, appeals to, to whites, but that racism is profitable, that racism creates wealth for the elite, that racism is to blame for the difficult economic conditions of people of color. And I would add to that all Americans. The framework of racial capitalism captures this undeniable truth by exposing the ways that economic systems of the United States have been racialized by design since their inception. An economy that uses the racist tools of theft, exclusion, and exploitation, all things that are present in your book, to drive wealth to the elite while suppressing and vanquishing the economic well being of people of color. It is the profitability of racism that makes the United States brand of capitalism so cruel. In other words, at several moments in the book, I kept thinking um, that racial appeals, I know this is, it isn't quite this simplistic, but that racial appeals were somewhat of a trick that elites could use to basically defend their wealth hoarding. But it's not just a trick, right? It's something that Whites in the areas that you're talking about um, understand, they understand and benefit from whiteness as property. They benefit from uh, racial predation. They benefit from strict segregation of neighborhoods and, and better schools that they get to go to. So they might be getting ripped off economically when we see these amazing figures in your book, right? They might be in the bottom that's you know declining but they are still enjoying a certain kind of plunder, a racial plunder that upholds the system that you're talking about. And so I guess I just wanted to hear more about, and you know, there are many scholars who have written about this. Most recently, Kianga Yamada Taylor, you know, talks about predatory inclusion and talks about, um, you know, she says where white suburban neighborhoods came to be valued as appreciating assets for the households who lived in them, Black urban neighborhoods were prized by the real estate industry for their extractive value, right? So I, I just want to get a sense of like, you know, I, I, I kept thinking about this conservative dilemma that um, you show really, really well. And it's, and it's, a, it's super intuitive. It's, it's, it's a debate we need to have. But I said, you know, what if it's not, um, what if the conservative, what if the appeal worked not because white identity is this nice seductive, easy thing that can be deployed and can be ginned up, um, but because 
this generation and previous generations of whites had enjoyed the profits, the opportunity, the livelihoods that were based around the theft of resources and plundering of black communities that was itself also driven by policy, driven by parties, driven by government. Um, you know, that they enjoyed the jobs and the school and the nice healthcare infrastructure and the businesses and the domestic labors um, and the safe uh, neighborhoods and didn't endure the safety deprivation that was concentrated on black neighborhoods. But this was all predicated and secured through black exclusion from an economy uh, uh, that was rigged up uh, 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 in passing abundance not just to elites, but also to poor and middle-class whites. So that's, I mean, that's the thing that I kept yeah. circling around and I couldn't quite square it because a lot of the evidence in the book sees race as in our psychologies. It sees it as a bias. It sees it as something right. that can get us, can get us animated, but isn't doing work economically, right? And, and because you all, have so um, shaped the careers of myself and others who do study racial predation and do study uh, 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 the policies that cemented uh, uh, or, or stripped uh, those places of, of, of economic and racial power. I just, I need you to give me something that tells me that you understand that race is not just in, you know, in the psychology, but is itself. Yeah. Um, and, we, you know. <laughs> so Vesla, Vesla, we do understand that. I'm not saying that the book fully grasps, grapples with it. It doesn't. Um, and we're actually con in continuing work we're doing on the American political economy. We're trying to grapple with it more. Mm -hmm. But we do understand that. And and indeed, you know, the the Trump campaign's invocation of this idea of making America great again is not just talking about it's not just talking about going back to a world in which white skin meant a lot more than it. I mean, going back to a world in which you didn't have to be around brown, black and brown people, but going back to a world in which white skin carried those privileges, privileges that many of these folks feel they're losing, right, uh, in these communities. So we recognize that. I, I do want to emphasize that something you said in, in passing, but I think it's really important is, though we, we find much of value in this, in this psychological work, our central argument is that this is a story where there's a very large top-down elite element. And it's, and it's not so much about tallying up the cost and benefits for white voters who vote for Republicans. It's much more about thinking about it. Why do they prioritize and think about certain kinds of threats? And they really are, it's really about threats, threats um, that are, I think, both economic and uh, racial and cultural mm -hmm. threats that are highly mutable, by the way. The NRA, mm -hmm. the Christian right, right wing media finds so many different targets to demonize. And, and you know, Trump's Twitter feed, you know, is, is, a, is a kind of catalog of the way in which you can provoke this resentment that, mm -hmm. um, that, that Lee Atwater wrote about in 1983. So I really want to get to folks' mm -hmm. questions, but I, but I also want to say I really appreciate your question and and think that we actually grapple with this you know in a way that is very useful for understanding the republican party but is not yet at the level where we could understand american capitalism so right. you know and that's but but i think you're you know fundamentally make america great again is about talking about this world right that predates some of the breakthroughs still incomplete that have occurred and our thinking about kind of how american capitalism and American democracy evolved is that African Americans are very, very late arrivals mm -hmm. to broad based uh, prosperity to true democracy. And a lot of what the Republican Party is doing now, right, is is mm -hmm. trying to pull back even that that late mm -hmm. movement. And so I do think it's wonderful mm -hmm. that we're having this broader conversation. But we should understand that part of the reason why we can't have a constructive response with this current regime is because of what the Republican Party has become. And that's centrally what we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Why has the party become this, uh, this particular marriage of plutocrat 
plutocracy and populism that stands in the way of an effective discussion of, about a, a broader form of shared prosperity uh, that would be and a truly multiracial uh, uh, set of parties. So, I mean, I, I, I th this is obvious. This is a hugely important point. Um, and, I, and, and in some ways, I think it, it points to a couple of different books uh, that, we're, um, that we're engaged in, in, in thinking about um, that would wrestle more with, with these elements of the American political economy. I think if we're thinking about what comes next, I mean, one mm -hmm. thing I would really take away from what you're, what you're raising here, Vesh, if you're thinking about what came, comes next, even the most optimistic, most hopeful scenarios, I think would have to recognize that the conversation that is going on in the U.S. over policing, right, and mass incarceration, right, um, is just one component, right, of a of a broader and actually much more challenging conversation to white America um, about resource hoarding um, and the ways in which you know economic and social segregation uh, keeps privileges for some and exclusion from opportunity for others along racial lines, right? And that, that's a conversation that I would say, like Democrats are now really starting to have the conversation about policing and mass incarceration. They're just beginning to have what I think is actually gonna be a much more difficult conversation because it requires more sacrifice, much more sacrifice, right? So, um, but that's in a conversation maybe for another, for, for another um, event. Um, but I, because one thing that I would emphasize about the defense of white privilege by Trump and by the Republicans is that because their devotion to the priorities of the plutocrats is so complete, right, they actually are not in any way defending the economic status of their white voters, right? They're actually, so if you look, for example, at their health care bill, enormously unpopular health care bill, right? Um, it would have been devastating to white working class Americans, especially in the South, especially older white working class Americans. The core of Trump's constituency would have been absolutely devastated by that legislation. And the reason why they would have been devastated by that legislation is because Republicans wanted to extract hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that they could use to introduce yet more tax cuts for wealthy Americans, right? So that's, that's the particular dynamic. Um, they, they are rhetorically, right, defending white status, right? Um, but they are not willing to allocate economic resources to the preservation of white status. That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you both. That's very, uh, very thoughtful responses. Um, so the, the, let's go, we're going to the Q&A and if anybody uh, has a question, please feel free to type it there. It's at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the very first one, I think is a very good question in, you know, um, in your past work, in fact, Chuck Schumer figures, you know, the Democrats figure more in your work on inequality. Um, and this uh, writer uh, says, uh, how, what about the eight years of Clinton and eight years of Obama? What roads of the Democrat have the Democrats taken which have lessened inequality? Um, inequalities are greatest in blue cities on both coasts. Both Clinton and Obama were, were loaded with Wall Street millionaires and the Clintons are multimillionaires and on and on. So you get the, the idea. Um, where do, and it's something I noticed as well, um, I kept wondering in the book, like are Democrats just sitting idly by while these, this carefully curated and constructed um, strategy uh, unfolds? Um, what are Democrats doing? And I think in some of your prior work, you've, you've brought them more centrally in. Yeah, let me just say a few things really quickly. I mean, one is, Absolutely, in winner take all politics, we argue that the Democratic Party gets really pulled and uh, it gets cross pressured basically by the rise in, rise in inequality. And that while Democrats are not always leading the charge for many of these policies, say financial deregulation, they often climb on the bandwagon uh, once they, they start uh, 
once it starts rolling. Um, the way we put it is that, you know, our image of politics when it comes to inequality is that, you know, the Republican Party will wear, you know, wears black hats and the Democratic Party wears white hats um, if you're anti-inequality. But in fact, it's much more like the Republican Party is wearing a black hat and the Democratic Party is wearing a gray hat. Um, but we really made a conscious decision to try to understand what's happened to the GOP. And, and I guess I would say, I don't think that the basic story we have hinges that much on exactly how the Democrats responded. I mean, the thing that's really important to say is the Democrats are really cross-pressured um, by inequality. It muddles, muddies their message. It leads to in-party uh, fighting, um, but that it has you know, supercharged the Republican Party and has, has unleashed the cycle that we call plutocratic populism. The other thing I would just say and very quickly is that um, we were surprised even after doing all this work by just how powerful and conservative the organized plutocracy is. So if you go to the very, very top of the economic ladder and you look at the very top echelons of the corporate world, and you focus on those elements that are most organized, most investing in politics, they overwhelmingly are conservative and they overwhelmingly have been backing the Republican Party. And so we, 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 we don't wanna say that this is a completely monolithic story, um, but it is surprisingly tilted, um, more so than you might think from looking at the pronouncements of, I don't know, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and certainly George Soros. The other, and, and related to that, and I'll just say, is that it's also the case that even the kind of less conservative elements of the plutocracy are pretty into the things that uh, the, the conservative plutocracy wants, like tax cuts for the rich, right? Um, you know, Apple, Apple is known as this very progressive company, but of course it was on the front lines trying to get the best possible deal. And, and at least in that case, that didn't really cause a lot of Democrats to say we want these big tax cuts for the rich, but it is very telling about the way in which um, even more progressive plutocrats are still pretty interested in these kind of self-enriching policies uh, that shovel money to the very top. Okay, a few other questions. Um, Paul, you didn't wanna weigh in on that, did you? I'd like to get to more questions. So. Okay, so another question is, um, and I know you can't predict the future, but what's the future of the populist wing of the Republican Party? Um, you know, your book goes to great lengths to really trace the evolution and, um, you know, uh, 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 Christian conservative evangelicals and how, you know, it wasn't a, it, it actually wasn't about abortion to begin with. It was about race. I mean, that was very striking. Um, and so do you have any reflections about how this will play out um, you know, is this a sustainable strategy? Um, so please. Well, our crystal ball's a little foggy, but um, on, on this one, I, I, I think we can say flatly, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lindsey Graham, back in the days when he despised Donald Trump before he loved Donald Trump, um, said, you know, we're, we're just not producing enough angry white guys to stay in business this way. Um, you know, the, the, um, the demographic realities are stark um, and, um, you know, the country is shifting away from all the constituencies that, that, that the, pop, the right wing populists have doubled, doubled down on. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean demography is destiny, right? Mm -hmm. And we say this clearly in the book, mm -hmm. uh, that what, what that means is we're in an incredibly precarious moment. Um, because uh, something's got to give. Um, either this strategy can't survive in free and, and fair elections as the demographic change takes place. It's not clear, uh, it, you know, it seems unlikely that it can survive in the 2020 election at this point. Um, it certainly is not gonna be a, a, viable, um, a viable political strategy in eight years, right? Just given uh, the demography of the country. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Republican Party is going to change. It could mean um, that we move towards a system in which a declining minority rules 
um, either a, in, in straight authoritarian fashion or in a fashion in which, and the US is already pretty far well, pretty far down this path where you can win elections with the minority of the vote because you've, um, because you've got a Senate that is hugely skewed towards rural areas and you've got gerrymandering uh, and you've got the electoral college. There are all these things to skew in the Republican direction. If you, and if you then use those advantages to create voter suppression, you can potentially reinforce and, and just uh, extend those advantages. So I wouldn't say that we think um, that the demise of the Republican party is inevitable, uh, but we do think that the demise of this strategy as a strategy that you can use to win elections in a free and fair electoral system, um, is, is running on fumes. Mm -hmm. This question isn't entirely separate from that, but I want to ask it anyway, because I think it's a bridge from that question. Do you think the racialization element will, will work less well in the context of the national reactions to the killing of George Floyd and other African Americans, or do Republicans not see that as their issue? So it's a little similar to what we just talked about, but I think that, um, you know, are we at a new moment where this, you know, what's been, where the conservative dilemma is no longer, it's not, it's, it's not viable to resolve it using uh, these appeals. Um, and then I also wanted to put in my own question, which is, where are the states in all of this? Um, so is this a, is this a, you know, much of the book is federal and um, national level developments. Um, are the states sort of mirror images of that? Are they along for the ride? Is there, how do they figure in uh, to the story? Well, why don't I take, go ahead, Paul. Say something about the, about the first point. Um, I'm sort of jumping the queue, but I was thinking about this because Vesley asked us about it um, earlier before we, before we were, live and I was thinking about um, the current social protests and their, their implications. And I do think, uh, obviously this happened after, after we'd finished writing the book, but I think in some ways it has, among all the other extraordinary effects that we're witnessing, um, it has had, in some ways, Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is accelerating uh, this moment in which I think large parts of the white electorate are being forced to reckon with our racial history and our racial present. Um, and many of them are, are not interested in buying what the right-wing populists are selling, All right? So there's a way in which, I mean, I do think this is a situation where um, uh, the let them eat tweets um, politics um, may be hitting a wall even earlier than it might have otherwise um, because, um, because we're being forced to have this reckoning um, with our racial past and our, and our racial present and that's, that's being manifested. And I, I think now, of course, this is a complicated topic uh, as well, um, but I've been struck by um, how wide the support is among white Americans uh, for the protests. Um, you know, it, it's a mixed story, but I think it's a, in many ways, it's an encouraging story. Yeah, and, and let me just thank you, Avesla, for the wonderful questions and for pushing us on some important issues and thank uh, the audience. Can I call you guys the audience for the, for the great questions? There's a lot um, that we weren't able to get to. Um, and I hope that you'll pick up the book and that you'll find uh, some of those answers in it. But, um, but I do want to say a word about the, the states. Um, and you know, and maybe think about it more broadly. Our system of constitutional government built up from this idea that the states are semi-sovereign entities, and the Senate, for example, represents the states in in a, in, in a very tangible sense. Right, every state gets two senators, leading to the most malapportioned uh, upper body in the rich world. This is really a very important part of what's going on, and. Um, and of course, we're seeing it writ large today with the with the kind of different dynamics in, in so-called red and blue states. But in, in the book, um, I think we draw out two really important implications of this very distinctive federal structure of government. One is with electoral administration all at the state level. And given that more states are basically, you know, that 
the states uh, are are on average, right, uh, more likely to be Republican because there's these vastly populated states, like uh, vast states with very low population, like Wyoming. That's the skew you see in the Senate. The result is that, like a lot of elections and uh, and a lot of states' role in the Electoral College is shift has shifted in favor of the Republican Party because it's a party that's advantaged in uh, in rural areas. And the other thing, and and this has allowed all this vote suppression as well. Um, the other thing is, and is that I do think that you know, what Paul was saying about this racial awakening is that the Republican Party does face a kind of flip side of that advantage because of the states, because it's hard for Republicans to separate themselves from the national party. So Paul lives in California, where the Republican Party has essentially been decimated because it wasn't able to adjust its message. And that and so that, along with right wing media, along with the outrage groups, there there are good reasons to think that Republicans are going to have a hard time responding uh, to these uh, pressures. But but the one thing I want to leave people with, and it's I don't know if it's hopeful or not, but it's that, you know, our country really requires to have having a constructive two party system. And the only way we get there right as as we as we show in this book is we've got to figure out how not just to have a better democratic party but how to fundamentally change the republican party so that it's not undermining democracy so it's not dividing our society and we think the only way you get there is if you understand what's going on so that's that's why we wrote the book on that note just let me say thank you so much for giving us this gem of a book and for just in in you know 215 pages the the vast insights that you were able to to give um not just academics but uh, uh the public as well i i really learned something new on literally every page and i ran out of writer because there was just so much there um, so thank you both so much and thank you for your scholarship and for showing up this way and for convening this conversation to um, dig into some of the themes. So thanks everyone. And thank you for the Q and A um, for posting such great uh, questions and um, be safe and be well, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vashla. Thank you, Vashla. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jacob.